Hi, like you probably saw on my Instagram, I wore the Zucchelli gown to the Chicago Ball. This exclusive event also had other YouTubers like Abby Cox, Morgan Donner, Noel from Costuming Drama, uh, Sustine, Christine from Sustine, and many others. But on my last video, we finished the drape, now we're gonna go for the cut. And I believe that this is the hardest part. Um, I work as a draper slash cutter. This is literally my profession. And I have a hard time thinking how to lay properly my patterns on the fabric. So I take extremely long time, I double check, and finally, after I lay all of the patterns, and then I trace everything, then I cut. The greatest thing about store-bought patterns, in my opinion, is that the pattern layout is already decided for you. And this is where companies usually hire me to test out their patterns before and we figure this out. The same thing in a costume shop, I as a draper will think about this and then a person that is my assistant will um, also um, think about that even more and then finally we will decide how to cut properly and even harder if there is any designs or patterns uh, that we need to match. Luckily, this gown here doesn't have any patterns that I need to match, but I have very few yards of this fabric. This is uh, vintage, like I said before, so I am trying to be very conservative in the amount of fabric that I'm using. I'm also hoping to use every little bit of scrap to create a day bodice or maybe not a day bodice because the beading is so uh, strong in this dress, but I'm gonna do a, definitely a second bodice that was very common at the time as well. Some people have asked me to release this pattern for them and I'm thinking about it, but I have a little bit of a uh, short time. Um, so here a quick question, would you rather a pattern with no seam allowance? Because every pattern that I do, I don't do seam allowance. I like uh, measuring whatever I have <laughs> the fabric and then I add my seam allowance after and this is what I'm doing right now. Or would you rather that the pattern already comes with seam allowance? Then you don't have to worry about that. You can just go ahead and cut. And it's funny because even though working with this for so long, I still have butterflies when I'm cutting a vintage fabric. It's just insane uh, how anxiety works. I work with this and this is something that I keep repeating myself in my head. Use the good fabric. You can use vintage fabrics on yourself. You don't have to save everything for the future. You don't want to become a hoarder. <laughs> and you can enjoy the good stuff right now. And you're not going to mess it up. You know what you're doing. You double checked. You're going to be able to achieve it. Seriously, it's funny how anxiety takes the best of us sometimes. And I try to remind myself to not let that happen. And if that happens to you, also say those affirmations. And absolutely not sponsored, but it could very much be because why not? Uh, but anyways, not sponsored. I just want to highlight the scissors that I'm using. These are tailor scissors and I use scissors from Brazil. Mundial scissors have one of the best scissors, shears, cutlery in the world since it's Genesis and I totally recommend it. And it's funny because every shop that I work has a pair of these scissors 
and I have my own. I have one that my mom um, gave me, and I bought this one as well um, that I use for vintage fabrics. But every shop that I work has their pair, so it's kind of like a ritual that every place that I go, I use Brazilian shears. If you haven't bought any, I recommend that one. Now we're going to just cut one of the overlap. Everything was double, but this one is single. And I cut two times for lining and the fashion fabric. And now for cutting up the skirt, as I lay out my pattern, as you can see, there's a little piece over there in the edge that it's not in the fabric and that's okay. We don't want the patterns to be overlapping each other because I need seam allowance. And it is very common of the skirts on the period to be pieced together. Especially the worth dresses that I have seen, they do have this specific piece out uh, on the corner right where the seams meet and typically it has embroidery on top so it's not going to be seen at all you will be able to see from the inside but not going to see on the outside also this is a dress that never happened uh even though i took inspirations from the house of worth this is an original house of kelly dress and that's also very common the john bright collection has a dress that is not labeled by worth but it's very similar now let's talk about Don Juan. Here's the update. Uh, he was a little bit under the weather last time, but now he's way better. Okay. Do you want it? Go. <laughs> Don Juan understands some commands better in Portuguese and some in English. So I try to speak both languages with him in case something happens to me. And now that I've finished cutting my skirt, I'm going to lay and cut all of my bodice. And this is how it roughly looks like. However, it's very wrinkly. So we're going to do for part two, ironing and pressing with faultless Niagara, ironing spray and starch. And here are some feathers that are going to go to my hair. Anyways, pressing and starching is a huge part of Brazilian historical fashion. And I really don't see people talking about it. Like, oh my god. Pretty much every other BIPOC house will have their own recipe. I am going to go for convenience with Faultless. And here's some songs about starching. Almir Neto is a master, but this song is not from the period. But what it is from the period is the fact that some of the underskirts were so heavily starched that they could even stand up by themselves. Now that we have everything cut and starched, time for sewing. And I'm going to do that with my portable heavy duty singer. Again, not sponsored. I really do love Singer and I am also a collector. I have several other machines from them and also little tools, vintage tools. And I like to live dangerously. That's why I'm drinking red wine near this vintage fabric. <laughs> Bad idea. And this is the first look. I'm testing. I always sew and test it before I put everything together because if you find out any mistakes, you are able to fix it. And that was the back. I leave the edges raw because we're going to face it with bias. This one is the front transpass. To finish it, I turn, sew, cut real close to the seam, and then I turn again. Just like you would do with a handkerchief. Same thing for all of the tool details that I added to the front of the bodice. This bodice is actually really easy to put together. The only difficulty that you have is really the fitting. You need to properly fit yourself or else the dress will not work. It needs to be very tight on specific parts but also lightly loose on other parts. And this is something that you can only achieve by doing this draping on the body. Since I can't drape on myself, I made this mannequin to a dummy of my body size. This is the, the speed that I'm working with. 
I remember as a kid watching somebody drape a fabric on somebody else's body and I thought that was the most magical thing ever and I became obsessed with it. And this is what I would do for a client. I would recreate their body on my mannequin. Um, so that way, if they are not able to travel here or I am not able to see them in person, I would have a very good fit. And typically for a dress like this, alterations would be very minimum. For this one, for myself, I had no alterations done. I take a long time. I take the proper time on the drape to then minimize all of the issues with alteration. What did you say? Just some gas because all of the pins are facing this way, and so I you pull keep it. Yourself. I pull it. All of them got inside of my hand. And this is the first look on my body. Mind you, I'm now wearing a corset, and it doesn't have any boning, but pretty good. Okay. Like I said before, even though yellow was a very popular color in the period, this is a dress that never happened. Originally, I was going to call this dress Yellow Ballerina because I was very inspired by the posters of Zhu Shihe. But on Instagram, you guys were so amazing to nickname this dress something else that I'm going to start calling it too. This is my joy dress. As you know, my family doesn't have much money and never in my family's um, history there was a dress like this or anybody that would be able to attend ball to even wear a dress like this. Throughout the years, the Zucchelli House has made several gowns but attended very minimum parties because as seamstresses, sometimes we were not invited to the party. Even clients didn't want us to say that the beautiful gowns that they were wearing were not original, but a house of Zucchelli creation. For this reason, my father stopped talking to a few rich cousins that we had. He still doesn't talk to them. I also had clients that asked me for replicas that I simply can't talk about it because they made me sign an NDA or they would just refuse to credit me. And this is why this is not a replica. I met my great-grandmother, uh, she was born in 1900, and she was most likely the first free person on that side of the family. She was amazing, and her name was Floristina, that means uh, forest of flowers. And I hope that she would be very proud of me. On the next video, we're going to do the decorations and the gloves. My name is Aidan Zucchelli. I am a designer, consultant, and researcher of ethnic garments. And I'll see you next time.